This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. All right, well, we'd like to get uh, started with this next uh, session, uh, which is the continuation of our uh, little symposium within a symposium on aortic diseases. Certainly, our next debate is the penultimate of our symposium. Two titans of vascular surgery duking it out. On the one hand, Dr. Cambria, who has spent his life developing the uh, approach to the open treatment of thoracoabdominal aneurysms, and on the other hand, Dr. Tudor, who is spending his trying to wipe out Dr. Cambria's field. So to begin this debate and throw down the gauntlet will be Dr. Tudor talking about the treatment of thoracoabdominal aneurysms. Who is best treated with branched endografts? Dr. Tudor. Well, that ups the ante, doesn't it? I'm trying to wipe out Dr. Cambria's field. But actually, given the pace at which things move in the United States, I think he could afford to... Uh, to feel fairly comfortable where he is. And in fact, if you look at the titles of the two presentations, you'll find out that they're not actually mutually exclusive. So I'm gonna sort of abandon the usual debate format and just tell you the truth. Um, uh, not that Dr. Cambria is not gonna tell you the truth, it's just gonna be a different truth. Uh, first disclosure, uh, the devices that I use are all come from Cook, as do the means to support the the research that we're doing, which is very expensive, by the way. Anybody who's enthused about getting an IDE should check the bank account first. Um, we're we're going to focus here on this choice, this dilemma, multi-branched or open surgical repair. By that, we mean, you know, the full Monty. Um, but the, when you're talking about risk-benefit, as you have to, um, when you're suggesting a way to treat a patient, particularly if the alternatives or one of the alternatives is investigational and you really don't have all the answers yet, um, you've got you to consider all the options. So for my purposes, I have to make sure that the patient has a very big aneurysm. So option isn't, uh, observation isn't really an option. I have to make sure that they're not going to, you know, they're not uh, 30 years old and an Olympic athlete that, that uh, open surgical repair is the only thing that would have the durability they need. And I'm not going to go into hybrid repair or chimps, which is chimneys, periscopes, and snorkels, but for some patients, those do offer advantages. This isn't a comparison where you can just quote the data and come to a conclusion, and anybody who does isn't to be trusted, um, because there are a lot of factors that confound a comparison between these two alternatives and that qualify any conclusions that you draw based upon published data. The first thing is device availability. When you're talking about what's best, you've really got to talk about what's available. In this country, of course, we've already uh, mentioned the FDA and the limitations they place on available technology. Um, outside of the United States, cost is probably the main factor. We're making these devices inside you from multiple components, from multiple manufacturers, and all of those components are expensive. And then any patient who has a very large aneurysm or symptoms suggestive of impending rupture can't wait for a customized device. If you've got something on the, sh on the shelf, great. If you don't, you're talking about open repair. And then there are local factors, and these, obviously, they, they matter the most when you're talking about uh, the endovascular techniques, because the skills are not necessarily uh, easy to disseminate or certainly not widely disseminated right now, but it also applies to the uh, open techniques of repair. There is a massive range of results between the single center, high volume uh, results, which tend to be very good, and the real world results, 
statewide uh, or other population-based results that tend to be very bad. Um, and California often gets quoted. I don't think that means that California surgeons are just not up to scratch. I think it means that uh, a lot of surgeons really can't get the kind of results you see here. Evolving technique, you know, we're trying to take a picture of a moving object. The picture is necessarily going to be a little blurry. That does not only apply to endovascular technique, where, where the technology is evolving, but it also uh, applies to um, open surgical repair, particularly lower extremity weakness. If you look at the rates of, of paraplegia for open repair, they've been going down and down. So a lot of qualifiers, a lot of compounding variables. Um, we've been trying to sort some of this out since 2000 when we did our first case with this homemade device. And the device has changed. This was the post-op CT scan. Looks a bit like normal anatomy, except made of metal. Um, the device has changed since then, but the fundamental approach remains the same, and that is we have an axially oriented cuff, which we catheterize, traverse the perigraft space, go into the target artery, and then replace that with a covered stent and line that with wall stents. This is what it looks like when you're doing it. And you can see, you can tolerate quite curved renal arteries. That said, we used to, for upgoing renal arteries, put upgoing cuffs. We tend not to do that now for a variety of reasons. And the other thing we tend not to do is to uh, create a branch by adding a balloon expanded covered stent to a fenestration. This is a crime that is going to be very widespread, I think, with the approval of the fenestrated device from Cook, because it's a marriage of convenience. The convenience is you have these devices available. You don't actually have to make them. But there are people who would do that, particularly the Cleveland Clinic, where they tend to use spiral cuffs for the celiac and SMA. It doesn't leave them room for any more cuffs, so they're doing fenestrations for the renals. We don't do that, and we don't do it for good reason. Even in cases where there's not a lot of room around the renal arteries, you see here, there's the cuff, here comes a catheter, you're trying to get the catheter to here. Where are, are you going to put it? There's no perigraft space. Well, there are techniques. You can always get across, and here you see we're across with a sheath. We follow that with a wall stent, we follow that with a covered stent. And despite the fact that the space was tight, the renal artery was small, we have a branch. Also, uh, the space can be quite tight when you're dealing with dissections. I'm not going to go into that right now, but um, we've treated a number of patients with similar anatomy to this and similar results to that. So why are we not uh, using this technique? Well, the number one is it's not really stable. The leverage applied to a transaxial covered stent like this is enormous. It's kind of like the forces that are being applied to this guy's shoulders whereas an axially oriented uh, branch transmits forces much more evenly, kind of like these uh, happy children. Uh, the main reason is that the cuffed approach is much more forgiving. You can be a bit high, you can be a bit low, your orientation can be wrong, and still, as in this case, a, a total screw up can be converted to total success. And with that in mind, we went along to develop uh, an off-the-shelf device where the variability in, in uh, artery position can be accommodated by variations in branch morphology and not necessarily variations in the primary device, as in this case that came in with a contained rupture. If the aneurysm is long, of course, you need extensions up and down. And we looked at lots of patients. Um, most of them are suitable. So based on anatomy and device availability, you're not going to find many restrictions. Big advantage of quality control, of, of standardization, of course, is quality control, um, as, as Honda will tell you. That said, um, our, our standard is changing. Everything is changing. This is a, an 18 French version of the device, which really is sort of our new standard, together with the proximal and distal components, pretty much the same as the old one. So how many patients are not able to get an endovascular repair based on unsuitable anatomy? Well, the answer is damn few. Um, when we review them, we find that the, the commonest reason uh, to eliminate the patient actually is that they don't have an aneurysm of suitable size. And with that policy, there are very, very few patients in whom you cannot place branches. This was one of them. In fact, it was the only one.
there was a little fold in the aorta right above that renal artery, and that precluded our getting to that target artery. Well, uh, are the results uniformly distributed in this population? And can I answer the question, which ben patients benefit most? Well, yes. Probably the biggest factor is gender. If you look at the men, the results are great. If you look at the women, the results are not so great. And you have to wonder why. Is it just that the women have small arteries that are difficult to navigate? Well, we don't really have a way of measuring that except to look at the operative time, and those times were equal. But we do know that the women were older and sicker, as assessed by the, the baseline renal function. What about aneurysm of extent? This is a massive factor for open repair. We don't really have the data to, to uh, compare these groups, although there is some suggestion that the type 2s and type 3s have a higher paraplegia rate, as you might imagine. What about branch type? The, the ones that go down, the ones that go up? Well, again, there's some suggestion that the upgoing branches are not doing quite so well. Long term, the results are pretty satisfactory. Uh, only one case of migration, and that was the distal end of a stent graft. No component separations, no aneurysm ruptures. By far the biggest long-term problem is branch occlusion. But you have to realize that we're talking about some, you know, close to 400 branches here. Most of them renal arteries. And if you look, most of the occlusions are fairly early in the post-operative course. And very few of them actually result in dialysis. If you look at all the patients who ended up on dialysis, only three of those can be attributed to, um, to renal artery occlusion. If you look at the patients who had unrelated causes, they started out with bad, uh, with elevated creatinine, with bad renal function. So, to address the question, which is better? Well, I think right now, depends where you are. Where you stand determines your, uh, your point of view. Certainly for men. I would say, you know, a man with a reasonably extensive thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm is going to do far better if he has me put in a branch stent graft than if he has anybody do an open thoraco repair. I think it's also particularly true of patients who are not going to do well with an open repair. Hostile abdomen, severe cardiopulmonary disease. Well, what about Boston? Well, you're going to hear about Boston soon, but let me just give you I, you know, I'll, I'll throw Dr. Camber a bone. He can have all the dissections and all the ones with shaggy mural thrombus. Because dissections, we have done a number of them successfully, but they are hard. They're multi-stage procedures, and they can throw you all sorts of complications that you hadn't imagined. And most these days, nearly all of our bad outcomes are related to embolism. And the risk factor for embolism is primarily the patients who have this shaggy mural thrombus. It seems to be mostly women. Most of them are old women. All right, thank you. Well, until that last slide, I was a little worried that the gauntlet was not so much thrown to the ground as it was kind of gently drifting towards the ground, but I think now there's a little, there might be a little blood on the floor. So to um, Take the opposite approach, Dr. Cambria, who will talk about which patients are better served with open repair. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Drs. Conti, Rapp, and Riley for inviting me to participate in this uh, excellent symposium, and I can't think of a better challenge uh, than debating uh, one of the world's premier aortic endovascular surgeons. And uh, you will doubtlessly note that I also think that uh, this discussion will not be accompanied by any pictures of Dr. Tudor riding a donkey, calling, calling him a Democrat or something worse, or, you know. Uh, but uh, we, we, we actually, uh, although I didn't see his presentation, I was number one, uh, very pleased to see his updated data because I have followed it very closely, and I am, A, glad that I omitted the slide from his uh, prior publications now that we've actually seen the updated data. Um, and so I'll, I'll start with uh, uh, a little discussion about, uh, you know, just what is the question here? Uh, is, the, is the gold standard in uh, 2012, of course, represents a very relative uh, consideration. Uh, 
And you heard some of the important points. Of course, the results of open operation for this problem vary widely and considerably as a function of the environment in which these patients are treated. And is the question endograft versus open? Dr. Tudor alluded uh, to the kind of uh, uh, a little bit pregnant type of operation, namely uh, the hybrid operation. And it seems appropriate uh, to put that in the equation uh, as well. And then, of course, the big bugaboo in the literature is, uh, and Dr. Schanzer alluded uh, to this, uh, you can't pick up an article uh, without it stating that these patients were, quote, high or prohibitive risk for surgery. But in fact, that's seldom quantified uh, uh, by metrics that we can really decide if that's uh, the case. So uh, just a brief summary uh, of what we've done uh, in Boston. This slide is somewhat uh, dated. Uh, I'm going to save the updated results for the uh, Binkley lecture. But when we had treated uh, almost 500 uh, patients with open thoracoabdominal aneurysm repair, the, the take-home messages were that the overall mortality in all comers was in the 8% range. If you tease out the ruptures uh, uh, and so forth, a uh, little bit under 5% in truly elective cases. Uh, the other important variable, and I'll show a little more detail on this later, is that consistently, and unlike abdominal aortic aneurysm repair, a high percentage of these patients continue to be treated in urgent or emergent circumstances. And that, I think, remains obviously one qualifier in terms of which procedure uh, uh, to uh, choose. And, uh, and clear, and it is still part of today's debate, uh, that the issue uh, of spinal cord ischemia continues to drive techniques and technical strategies to repair these uh, patients in the endovascular paradigm, just as it has in the uh, open paradigm. And I'll get to one of the considerations first. How about the durability consideration? I was very interested to see Dr. Tudor's data uh, on the renal branch uh, occlusion data, which I hadn't seen before. But how about the long-term durability? This is, of course, a constant in aortic endograft repair. You heard debates uh, about it uh, this morning. Well, we've looked at our uh, long-term results uh, in these patients. and. Uh, this this uh, paper is a few years old, but in long-term follow-up, uh, we found that 10% of these patients will have another aortic event. And almost uniformly, that event is repair of another aneurysm in a non-contiguous aortic segment. Patient has a thoraco, five years later, they have an ascending aortic aneurysm repair. And furthermore, uh, the predictors of that, interestingly, uh, similar to Dr. Tudor's data, are female data or female sex and a patient treated initially for a ruptured aneurysm where obviously the surgeon may compromise on the extent of uh, resection because of the clinical circumstances of the situation. And the other thing to say about it is that if you look at our late survival in our thoracoabdominal aneurysm cohort, it is exactly superimposable upon what you can achieve after open repair of abdominal aortic aneurysm, suggesting, of course, that the resource uh, investment to get these patients through uh, is worth it. And we've even done things uh, like look at long-term functional outcomes because uh, there's this uh, concern that bringing patients through a big operation, well, they'll never be the same. We've looked at this, and uh, at five years after operation, permanent loss of functional capacity was, in fact, uh, rare in our patients. Well, Dr. Tudor introduced the fact that I've shown you some MGH results. Uh, this is a national inpatient sample uh, uh, paper. Again, it's a bit old. Uh, it was published by Gibb Upchurch uh, and colleagues from uh, Michigan. And it suggested that the real-world mortality for elective, non-ruptured, open thoracoabdominal aneurysm repair in the U.S. was nearly 25%. Now, I don't know about you, but 
I don't recommend too many elective operations to patients that are attended by a 25% mortality. And again, uh, Dr. Tudor pointed out that California seems to be in the habit of looking uh, at this uh, m in more depth. Uh, this is David Rigberg's paper, it was presented at SVS a few years ago. And it looked at over 1,000 thoracoabdominal aneurysm repairs in the state of California. The upfront mortality for all comers was nearly uh, 20%, but more impressively, the overall mortality at one year was 30%. And that mortality was linearly correlated with patient age. And, and the take home message was that old folks simply shouldn't have this operation because their survival at one year is uh, so poor. Uh, and the other concern, of course, in patient and clinical decision making, it's perfectly obvious that many of the patients that we see for any number of these consideration, it is simply illogical to consider an extensive open operation in many of the candidates that we see, and a little more of that later. So in my view, uh, and uh, the bone that was thrown to me, you might see uh, here at the bottom uh, of the slide, the first thing to say is that who should have an open repair? Well, the simple question is anyone outside of the San Francisco area. The biggest issue in this arena right now, of course, is the agonizingly slow rate of design, engineering, regulatory constraints. And as I reminded Tim when we were chatting just yesterday, it is now three years since we thought the sponsor uh, would bring forward a limited center phase one study, and we're still waiting for that, so that's been an issue. Durability concerns we've touched on already, and then the patient features, which I think can be broken down into these elements, anatomic considerations as shown here, Obviously, the urgent or emergently prese uh, presenting patients will, in general, not be able to wait uh, for what may be a custom design graph, so those sorts of logistic considerations. Good risk patients in appropriate environments, I think I've shown you that the results can be favorable, and there'll be more of that uh, at the Binkley Lecture. And then these anatomic considerations. Uh, starting from the bottom, uh, Dr. Tudor showed you that uh, the paraplegia, spinal cord ischemia inju injury, and we know from the paradigm of thoracic endografting that the risk is clearly going to go up in long segment coverage. So there may be patients uh, dr where the choice of operation is driven by the appropriate or the assessment of risk of spinal cord ischemia. Uh, second, uh, he showed you just uh, a couple of patients would be excluded because of anatomic considerations where branches needed to be placed. And I admire his technical skill in treating some of these patients, but the anatomic configuration of a large thoracic component a buckled and small visceral component and a large infrarenal component is a fairly common sort of anatomic variation on the theme. I am pleased to see that he's thrown me chronic dissections and Marfans, and I'll show you a document that seems to be consistent with that. And then we'll talk a little bit about the patient with the type 4 aneurysm that constitutes a, cons a considerable number uh, of his patients. Well, just briefly, uh, we've known for some time in the open paradigm that we can predict, and I'm pleased to see that Dr. Tudor's data is similar to, uh, to ours. In clinical decision making, the presence of antecedent fixed, not able to be reversed, renal dysfunction by, for example, the fact that one renal artery is occluded and there's a 90% stenosis to the other, should present the surgeon with some real pause because this sort of fixed, non-reversible renal dysfunction constitutes in its own right a limitation on survival and I feel should always figure prominently in clinical decision making. Well, how about the paradigm of spinal cord uh, ischemic complications? Again, in virtually everyone's experience, and this is not just patients with rupture and hypotension because 
Obviously, most patients with rupture and profound hypotension and thoracoabdominal aneurysm are not going to survive. But the circumstances of non-elective operation and thoracoabdominal aneurysm extent have been historically risk factors uh, predicting spinal cord ischemia, and it has been in our material too. Well, how about this uh, halfway option, the hybrid operation? Ever since commercial availability of the first thoracic endograft in 2005, this has been a potential option uh, in treating patients as shown uh, in this uh, CAT scan on the right. And obviously that can be at the aortic arch, but that's not what we're talking about now, the visceral segment. And in a handful of patients, this has provided a very viable uh, treatment option. This started with the group from St. Mary's who readily admitted that they adopted it because they couldn't get the mortality of open repair under 20%. Their first 25 patients presented at SVS looked good when I saw the last updating of their material when they had about 45 patients. They had both mortality and paraplegia in the 20% range, and as you can see, that, and as you will see shortly, that has been the experience uh, uh, elsewhere. This is a paper of ours. Uh, we treated 23 high-risk patients, and I can tell you that in these patients, they were all patients that I turned down for open operation based on comorbidity. So at least in this group, I know exactly what I'm talking about in terms of high-risk patients. Uh, and the mortality in these patients, 22%. I fundamentally abandoned the procedure for patients who I would otherwise recommend an observational course. And I'm indebted to Gustavo Oderich for loaning me the next few slides. He put together a, a series of patients, uh, and as you can see, it was 163 thoracoabdominal aneurysm patients. Let's ignore the pararenals because we're talking about this animal today. Treated at a variety of centers across the US, and he presented this just last year at SVS. The overall 30-day mortality was 14%. In the thoracoabdominal aneurysm patients, it was 16%. And if you remember my sort of slide, uh, this is twofold increase compared to what we achieved with conventional open operation in these patients, and the results did not differ depending on the center's experience. And this slide just shows you that in that group of 163 thoracos, the spinal cord injury rate was a full uh, 10%. So, I would tell you that I think hybrid operation is not the answer. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, overall in terms of patient uh, morbidity, I think equivalent to open operation. Well, let's handle the type four uh, aneurysm for a moment. We recently reported our results in nearly 200 patients, uh, and here are the data. Operative mortality and spinal cord ischemic complications under 3%. Now, these data are not uh, unique. Uh, this is a series from the University of Pennsylvania published last year in JVS. Mortality a little higher, but in the 5% range and rare paraplegia. So I'm concerned with extending coverage to the lower descending aorta with an endograft approach in a group of patients where the results with conventional operation in appropriate hands have really been quite good. In terms of patients with dissections and or Marfan syndrome, I'm going to quote, there are several things in this consensus document published mostly by our colleagues in cardiac surgery, published a few years ago. There are certainly some things in that that I don't necessarily agree with it, but as they reviewed the experience with open and focused on clinical decision making for endograft repair, the consensus recommendation is that chronic dissections and patients with Marfan's or other syndromic conditions should be treated with open operation, and that is certainly a position uh, that I uh, agree with. And if you look at the dissections versus uh, degenerative aneurysm, you can see that the long-term survival is better in the dissection patients, but that's probably related to the fact that they're younger at the time that they are treated. 
How about the spinal cord uh, ischemic complication consideration? Uh, this paper from Michael Jacobs uh, sums up the anatomic and clinical fact that in patients with thoracoabdominal aneurysm, there is a wide variety of potential collateral circulation. And I agree that we're just learning now about the management, both intraoperatively and perioperatively in these. So I think that there will be patients where, in fact, open operation may be safer in terms of the risk of cord ischemia, but I admit they may be difficult to define although I think that they probably will be the patient whose endograft needs to extend from annulus to anus, as it were. And clinically, the observations we know uh, are different in terms of the paraplegia risk between extent one and extent two. So in conclusion, there are a number of practical and logistic considerations referable to the availability of an appropriate device. I think that the hybrid operation uh, has proven itself to be a very niche type of procedure, which in my view should be restricted to a very limited subset of patients because the overall experience with it, I think, has been rather poor. An open repair with current operative strategies, which I'll review shortly, remains the gold standard with the important proviso that the results achieved in center of excellence is what we're talking about. Thank you for your kind attention.